So Zizek, the sublime object of ideology, has three modes or purposes or aims. The first is that he wants to introduce the reader to fundamental concepts of Lacanian psychoanalysis. The second is that he wants to return to a reading of Hegel through Lacan, Hegelian idealist philosophy. And three, he wants to provide a new critique of ideology using some concepts from psychoanalysis and Marxist theory. Zizek starts out his, his work by showing that Marx invented the symptom. Marx's symptom came when the bourgeoisie claimed a universalist position of law, rights, order, law and order, rights, and property. The symptom from this is the group of laborers that had to sell their labor into a commodity form known as the proletariat. The proletariat is the symptom of bourgeoisie capital and it is a positive order meaning it is exists in actual space. The proletariat, the bourgeoisie, is a positive order that exists in metaphysical space. He found also that this antagonism, this symptom, was in was given form through the commodity form. That is, when a laborer makes a shoe or they make some product, let's say it's a shoe or a garment, the, antagon the very antagonism that puts them in their position in society is, inst is instilled inside of that garment or that shoe. So the, com the commodity form, the shoe, is then sold. Part of the money from that shoe goes back to the laborer for, to pay a wage, but then a profit is made from that shoe. And the profit goes to the bourgeoisie manager, managerial class, and the and the rest, some of the cost of labor goes to the proletariat. So that in that very commodity form, you can see the structure of social relations in that very commodity, with part of it going to wages and the profit going to the managerial class. This is a significant discovery because the symptom designates not only the positive order, the bourgeoisie, the proletariat, but also designates that objects are created in the pro process of production that relate to that structure of reality. So the very garment, the very shoe, the shirt, whatever you want to call it, is made and that commodity has in it the buttons, the stitching, belie how much labor went into it and the money that I exchanged for this shirt went to the the profit went to the bourgeoisie managerial class and some of the cost of the shirt went to the laborer so the very social positive relations of social relations are embodied in that commodity form marx also discovered something called the commodity fetish which is when well, let's say there's good b and good c one and a half units of good B equals three units of good C. Or one unit of good B equals two units of good C. Marx identified the commodity fetish, which is the idea that if you take good B and good C, you can relate them to each other and actually create an exchange value related to quantities of each. That translate, a quantity of good C translates to a quantity of good B. This is done through the exchange of money. But the commodity fetish is the idea that there is no actual relation between good B and good C. And yet, it can be expressed almost as a mathematical law that good B equals this quantity of good C. And that is a fetish in itself. The idea that two unrelated objects can equal each other. That is a fetish. That's called the commodity fetish, and that's what Marx discovered. Now, Freud discovered the symptom in the subject, whereas Marx discovered the symptom 
of bourgeoisie society and capital society. Freud discovered the symptom in the subject themselves. And what Freud said was that if there is an underlying psychic issue in the subject, it will lay within the unconscious of the subject's mind and it will be expressed through dreams and through an urge to do certain things. And this is the drive. This is not this not a good term to drive, but an urge by the unconscious to do a certain thing suggests that there is a symptom. The symptom is expressed from the unconscious into the conscious mind through latent dream content. And when there is a symptom, it is pushed into the unconscious, but it expresses itself piecemeal through relaying of imagery, images and dreams, ideas, thoughts, urges to the conscious mind. So whereas for Freud, the symptom is pushed into the unconscious or the id and then impinges on the conscious reality of that subject. For Marx, the symptom is, is a positive order that's pushed into the commodity form. So the commodity form ab operates as the unconscious mind, if you can imagine that. The commodity form operates as the unconscious mind and it expresses the commodities and expressed to the, the the bourgeoisie, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, the commodity form that expresses their social relations or the symptom of their society, the antagonism underlying bourgeoisie society. And for Freud, the subject, let's say, has a schizoid disorder that is expressed from the unconscious mind into the conscious mind and relates to the subjective position of the ego and the, and the subject themselves. Now it should be noted that the difference between the Lacanian, the Lacanian, the Lacanian constellation of the subject psyche, the, at the center of the Lacanian constellation of the subject psyche is a fundamental lack known as the object petite a. The object petite a is that object at the center of the subject that has no, it has a signifier, but there's nothing signified, there's nothing there, it is a void at the center of the subject. And there's the concept of joissance, is the idea that the subject gains gratification from trying to fill the void within them. But it can never be accomplished directly. It can only be accomplished in a circling movement, a, re a repetition, a repetition going around the center of the subject. The void is known as the object petit day. And Joe Assange is trying to reach that object petit day, that void, with different desires. You desire this product, you buy that, you're happy for a few minutes, and then you lose your happiness. What it is in partially trying to fulfill that, that is known as the death drive in Freudian psychoanalysis. Now, that drive is, is where the real, un, what Zizek says, the real undead life exists. When you're constantly trying to approach avoid nothingness at the center of your subjectivity that keeps you alive as if a uh, animated undead object you become something of a zombie trying to fulfill that void and approaching it you get pleasure at Joe Assange out of approaching it but the drive is the death drive itself Now there's other subjects, um, I should say that Lacan, so Lacan posited that at the center of the subject there's a void. And that's his discovery of the symptom, is that at the center of the subject is the symptom of a void nothingness. A hole to be trying to be filled. And that goes back to the, the sayings that you used to hear in different 
stories at Boy Scouts or whatever, you would hear that there's always a want to be fulfilled. There's a, as if there's a hole in man's heart. Lacan did nothing but deposit the actual psychic structures and name them to fulfill that story. Now Lacan, so Lacan identified the void at the center of subjectivity and that was his discovery of the constellation around the symptom. Marx discovered, as we discussed, a positive order of being rather than a void. He discovered the antagonism between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat rather than saying there's a void at the center of something here or there. He said there's a positive order here and here. Bourgeoisie and proletariat. There's other concepts brought up in Zizek's book that amount to the position of God in the symbolic order. And if you don't know what the symbolic order is, I will get to that now. The symbolic order is any time it's any position in speech of certain constellation of the certain constellation of a subject's understanding of reality. So his his place is on a certain part of the symbolic order. He's signified. God is signified above or anywhere above the big other, what it's known as in Lacanian theory, the big other. There's also the void at the center of the subject, the object petite. So there's different points in the constellation. His friends would be in the constellation, his social relations, his boss, his employer. They would all be on a plane of representation. And the symbolic order places the subject at a certain point, signifies him at a certain point. And there's signifiers representing his boss, his friends, the big other, God. God as the big other. The object petite A. The symptom. Everything is represented. You can think of it as a neural network in your in your mind. That each let's say, let's say each neuron has a certain idea attached to it. And it's connected to a network of other neurons and other ideas. The symbolic order then is almost a uh, representation of the net the network in your mind of neural connections with the big other the superego the object petite the subject his friends his boss his employer his family all at different points in the symbolic order all represented by a certain signifier or a symbol that represents them so that is why it's called the symbolic order now Lacan identified that one of the key questions asked by the subject towards the big other and especially the big other the god figure is chez vous which means what do you want of me what of me and he identifies that the fundamental ethos of the jewish religion is to say to god what do you want of me what do you want of my people what do you want of our destinies that's another concept explored by Zizek I believe that he says that Shevu is a fundamental, unavoidable, unavoidable question in the subject's mind. There's also a description of the symbolic order and the plane of intentionality, the different positions of castration, which I don't fully understand myself because I haven't. It's quite involved theory, even more involved than what we've been going over so far. The position of castration, the big other. I suppose it's something of the symbolic network that I described. Where there's different points representing different psychic structures, different subjects. Now we have to get to Hegel. For Hegel, this is where Zizek speaks of Hegel. There's a position of absolute knowing, which means that the subject is delineated in space. You can think of a circle being the subject. They're delineated in space as against their grounding and their background. And being delineated in space, the subject has a certain horizon and they can see out into the distance from that circle. That subject can see out into the horizon. 
and has a thought horizon or, or an ontology. It's a very metaphysical concept which places the subject in space against nature or the grounding known as in Zizek's theory, known as the non-all. The non-all is the container, is the background and the grounding beneath the subject that is the non-all. And the concept that Zizek wants to get across is that with that subject, the thought horizon, the ontology, the background, the non-all, the subject is the the subject himself is the all of substantial being, of substance of substantial being, the all. The subject is the all. The nature, the net background, and the grounding beneath the subject is the non-all container. The idea that Zizek wants to get across in this book in Hegelian Ideals Philosophy as a sort of supplement to Hege Hegel is that there is a fundamental antagonism within within the structure of reality even Hegelian idealist absolute knowing reality there's a fundamental gap let's say it's here's the subject here's the thought horizon the horizon extends so far and then it has edges and on the edges what is impinged upon the edges of the thought horizon or the ontology is the Lacanian real which is all around above below on the sides the Lacanian real impinges on the horizon of the subject impinges on the horizon of the subject and the gap between what you see and what you know is out there in the real you never really know what is out there fully but what you can see is that there is a darkness impinging on the horizon and that gap that gap is a fundamental according to Zizek structure of reality the gap between knowing and not knowing what you do not know and the example that I like to use is a reference to the Super Mario Bro Smash Bros video game where there was a platform that the characters would fight on a background and then the screen would be the would be the edges of the background so you can think of the platform in the background as being the non-all or nature or the container the characters as being the subjects and the edges of the TV screen as being where what's being generated out of the void it is a void and what's being generated out of the void is flat is a screen image and the TV itself is a void or the generator the Lacanian real non-all and subject come out of some void, the Lacanian abyssal real, the abyssal real of Lacan. This is how Hegel's thought is placed in metaphysical space. Hegel's thought is a very, it's a three dimensional thought, and even beyond three dimensions because it includes the void or the nothingness or the real. So the Super Mario's Smash Bros. reference is, I think, effective for explaining this concept. So again, the subject or the little characters exists delineated against the background and the undergrounding beneath its feet the platform would be the grounding in the game the background is the non all container and the TV itself is the, is the Lacanian real or the abyssal real or the void out of which the non all and the subject is generated and so again that is the layout of, of Hegel's theory and then Zizek's contribution is that he says the, the Lacanian real and the ontological thought horizon where they meet the edges, that impingement of the real on the edges of the thought horizon, that is a gap that is fundamental to the structure of reality. Zizek concludes, Zizek concludes by explaining that after having read Lacan, a subject a psychoanalytic or anal analyzand, I think it's called the psychoanalytic subject will realize that there is no big other that there is no big other they will recognize the idiocy of the real the unarticulated quality of the Lacanian real and they will no longer see themselves as subject because being a subject requires a double move in reference to the big other in reference to the symbolic network and once they remove the big other from the symbolic network, they remove the master signifier, as Les Lacan would call it. The master signifier is removed. The big other, God figure, if there's nothing above us, 
then the whole symbolic network falls apart and the subject cannot even do a double reflection where they see themselves posited. So when they look in the mirror, if they do not have God in their mind or they do not have the big other in their mind of some sort, whether it be historical necessity of Marxism or otherwise, they do not have the big other, they cannot even see themselves as a subject and their space is no longer delineated against the background that we discussed with Hegel. So to repeat, they realize there's no such thing as a big other, it's simply a figment of our symbolic network and imagination. They know they see the idiocy of the real impinging on the edges of their reality and there's they know there's nothing they can do about it. And further, they see they no longer posit themselves as a subject in space and they are a free floating entity of which they know no limits and they do not know themselves. This I hope is a discussion that will enlighten you as to the parameters of Zizek's the sublime object of ideology. I hope that I did effective today and I will make more videos on other Zizek books and maybe return to the sublime object of ideology from time to time. This is not the definitive edition but was simply a long lecture which I hope achieved some sort of semblance in your mind of Zizek's understanding of the sublime object of ideology. Thank you.